Okay, so here we are. Uh, all right. And uh, uh, let me take care of a couple of things first. And the recording is on, I believe. Uh, when will I post the grade? Well, it will take a couple of days. It will uh, give me about two to three days, and uh, uh, it, will, it will post on your CUNY first. And also in, uh, you know, where I post, uh, where I post the grade here. Currently, currently, uh, um, okay, this, this includes, this is only up to midterm, I believe, but, you know, uh, after, you know, um, uh, in about two, three, uh, two to three days, you will see, you know, uh, this file updated. And we'll say, not interim grade, but the uh, uh, complete grade breakdown. It will say complete grade breakdown with attendance. So give me a few. Um... Anyway, um, let me see. I haven't signed in. So I need to do that. Um... Oh, what's going on? Uh, yeah, well, give me a uh, give me a couple of minutes. I'd also sign in. Sign in as a student or preview user. Here we go. Then. All right, I'm signing in there. Okay. All right, so, okay, so let's pick it up from uh, where we left off uh, in our last class, right? We were talking about the uh, uh, sources of the risk, right? Uh, and in the stock market, right? I mean, uh, if you are talking about the stocks, the uh, sources come from two, the, the risk comes from two sources, systematic risk and non, it says unsystematic, but sometimes it's called non-systematic, non-systematic risk. And systematic risk comes from uh, market, financial market, right? Market risk, you know, stock market. And interest rate risk, reinvestment rate risk, purchasing power risk, which is um, uh, inflation, right? In other words, and exchange rate risk. And it's basically, you know, a macroeconomic system, right? All these risks are basically you know, coming from the macroeconomic system. Hence, it's called systematic risk or systemic risk. And uh, non-systematic risk are diversifiable meaning that it can be diversified away. Diversified, you know, meaning through portfolio, right? If you diversify your portfolio, uh, these non-system, non-systemic risks will be diversified away. However, systematic risk cannot be diversified away. In other words, portfolio cannot do this. So uh, we need, you know, uh, to, uh, we need uh, to lower our uh, portfolio beta. I mean, you know, portfolio beta, so we're gonna be talking about beta today. Uh, so that, uh, so that's where we were last time. So let's continue to listen, okay? So that's the reason uh, airlines industry is more likely to get the loan, even though it is you know, in huge amount. And compared to that, what does the re restaurant industry have to uh, uh, offer as collateral? Huh? Oven, refrigerator, meat locker. What is the most expensive asset, capital asset? 
of a restaurant business. Maybe the meat locker, meat locker, right? The freezer. Oven, I don't think oven would uh, have that much collateral value, right? Um, so uh, that is the uh, financial risk, okay? Uh, industry, industry, financial risk is different. And what is the business risk? Business risk is really specific to that uh, particular business. Uh, for example, you've seen, you've seen it for yourself. Now, during this pandemic, what happens to the restaurant industry? It's devastating, right? No restaurant business. What about the travel and tourism? All devastated. Airlines, all devastated. But IT industry, is IT industry um, devastated by the pandemic? No, on the contrary, they are actually thriving. Zoom, right? Google Hangout, all these, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, internet uh, conference apps, and I mean, during the, uh, as people are locked down, everyone, you know, you don't, you can't go out, you can't, you know, um, uh, eat, uh, you know, dine out, or you can't, you know, uh, travel, but you are spending more Wi-Fi time, right? Online, you're spending more time online. So obviously, you know, IT industry is uh, not hit by the pandemic, but most other industries are hit by pandemic. Right? Uh, also pharmaceuticals not hit by uh, pandemic. Pharmaceuticals are doing better. You see? Um, so that's something specific to uh, different um, industries, right? The factors that. So uh, the important thing is um, of these two risks, right? Systemic and unsystematic. Unsystematic, unsystematic risks can be diversified away. What does that mean? Uh, you, you construct a portfolio and your portfolio will consist of different uh, companies from different industries. And as you have more and more different industries, at least like 15 to 12 different industries in your portfolio, um, the ups and downs in each industry will, and the uh, different uh, degrees of financial risk will uh, cancel out each other. I mean, it, it may not, depending on how well diversified they are, if it is well diversified, uh, meaning, you know, every industry is, you know, uh, your portfolio is a collection of every industry, and they will uh, uh, almost, you know, cancel out, uh, unsystematic risk. Hence, they, it's called diversifiable risk because the risk can be, the unsystematic risk can be diversified away. But systematic risk doesn't benefit from, there's no benefit uh, coming from diversification because diversification cannot uh, uh, eliminate systematic risk because systematic risk is coming from the economic system, macroeconomic system. It affects every industry across the board all equally, right? And then so diversification cannot help reduce the systematic risk, but it will reduce non-systematic risk uh, significantly. So uh, let me show you, uh, graphically, it can be uh, represented. Um, this curve is the uh, uh, total risk of the portfolio. And in the portfolio, right, if you have just one stock, the total risk is this side. This is the entire risk of the uh, uh, market, right, the uh, systematic risk and non-systematic risk. And these are the numbers of uh, stocks or assets, securities, right? The more assets you have in your portfolio, about 15 to 20, then the total risk drops drastically, total portfolio risk drops drastically. But what drops is the unsystematic risk part, right? Unsystematic risk comes to almost to zero, but it never reaches zero. It's called asymptotically zero. Asymptotic means it's reaching the, uh, it's approaching the axis, but never touches the axis, right? Asymptotically zero. Uh, so uh, by the time you have about 20 assets in your portfolio, um, you are, your risk is mostly down to uh, the systematic risk only and unsystematic risk is completely uh, diversified. Okay, makes sense? All righty, so that's it for today. Uh, so we'll uh, continue uh, okay. in the next class. Uh, okay. That's the end of our um, video number, uh, you know, uh, third video, right? Where was I? So, uh, Number four, right? So uh, today we are continue uh, minimize uh, the uh, uh, so uh, today we are continuing uh, the discussion about the uh, uh, a risk, you know, a portfolio risk, uh, how you. Uh, minimize uh, the risk through uh, diversification, portfolio diversification. And um, so in our last, in our last class, uh, we, uh, we uh, finished off our class with the, uh, um, how uh, the non-systematic uh, portion of the risk is uh, diversified away, right? Through uh, 
uh, diversified, well diversified portfolio. And I said, um, when you uh, when you include about 15 to 20 uh, assets or stocks in your portfolio, right, uh, your total risk, overall risk uh, goes down drastically. But what actually goes down is the uh, that uh, unsystematic uh, part of the risk and the systematic part doesn't go away through uh, diversification. Now, uh, here, uh, another thing uh, you need to uh, remember about the uh, diversification is that the um, it's not just the number of the uh, company, right? It's not the number of the company. Um, it is actually the number of industries, right? Remember, the uh, uh, unsystematic risk is basically the uh, risk, uh, uh, specific risks that are different uh, industry by industry, right? And therefore, if you have... Uh, only if you have only 20 stocks in your portfolio, uh, only in numbers and not diversified by the industry, but let's say you have 20 stocks from the same industry, uh, 20 companies in the same industry, that doesn't help at all, right? It doesn't, it's not a diversification. Now, let me show you uh, uh, an empirical evidence. Why? Uh, different industries are, I mean, uh, think about it. Uh, first of all, uh, the companies in the same industry are highly correlated right, in uh, many aspects. Um, so as an example, during the uh, uh, this, you know, COVID-19 crisis, pandemic crisis, right? Uh, and I, I mentioned this in our last uh, past couple of uh, lectures, that the uh, uh, travel and tourism, right? Travel and tourism industry is highly uh, adversely affected by this crisis. Uh, not just the travel and tourism, you know, uh, of course, most industries are, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, IT industry is uh, relatively, you know, uh, not affected by uh, the uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, uh, and some companies are even, you know, thriving. Um, and uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, are also uh, thriving. Uh, Amazon uh, is uh, thriving. So, uh, but then, you know, uh, hotels, restaurants, you know, um, uh, transportation, you know, um, they are all suffering, right? So if you have uh, you know, stocks from a single industry, uh, you're not diversified at all. You're not, you know, uh, sufficiently insulated from the uh, uh, the risk. So to insulate uh, your position, investment position from uh, the risk, you must diversify uh, the industries. So let's take a look at this example. I'm, I want to show you, um, you see what this is. Uh, this was back in 19, uh, I mean, uh, 2006, 2000 uh, through 2011. I collected data of, uh, I collected data of like, you know, different two companies from two companies from each industry, right? And there were like, you know, a nine, eight or nine, uh, uh, six industries uh, represented in this portfolio. So um, I picked two companies from, as I said, you know, Apple and Google, uh, they are what, um, IT industries, right? And then Northrop, Ray, Raytheon, Northrop and Raytheon are probably, you've never heard of them because, you know, they are not consumer, you know, uh, they are not consumer goods. Uh, they are not in consumer civilian consumer goods. They are all military. Uh, uh, you know, they are a uh, defense industry. In other words, Northrop uh, is a company that has been making uh, fighter planes. You know, from World War II and especially in the modern, you know, uh, uh, modern times. You know, uh, jet fighters. You know, uh, F5. You know, F5 was already you know, uh, 1960s. You know, 1961, 60, uh, something, 65. Uh, uh, F5, F20, and Raytheon is a company that makes uh, 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 smart bombs. Okay, uh, it's not it's not really you know uh, um, something new anymore because uh, the first time I heard of the name Raytheon was back in like 1990 when it was first you know uh, uh, Desert Storm, first Gulf War, and that was probably the first time that the missile hitting the target was televised on the TV on CNN uh, because the uh, uh, the missile is GPS guided and laser guided, and in the uh, warhead of the missile, there's a camera that broadcasts, you know, as it tar lands on the target, right? It's finding its own target, uh, and it lands on the target, and the camera is, you know, actually broadcasting, you know, uh, its trajectory. I mean, uh, so the, you know, um, viewers on TV were able to watch the missile actually, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> going, you know, uh, uh, you know, towards its target, and then, you know, the screen goes off because, of course, the camera gets blown off, you know, the minute it hits the target. Um, but, but that's why it was called smart bomb. But, you know, that was already 30-year-old technology. I mean, you know, if you think about it, it's 2020 now. That was 1990, right? And you could see on CNN, right? 
target, hitting its own target. So you've never heard of these companies, but they are uh, obviously in the uh, in the defense industry. Right? Uh, some people might, you know, say, "Oh, that's you know, uh, devils in." Look, but you know, uh, it's inevitable. You know, the military. Uh, you have to maintain a, a strong military. To uh, uh, it goes without saying. You know, you, uh, there is something called necessary evil, right? People say, you know, uh, you know, you cannot be naive. You know, uh, about 20 years ago at BMCC, there was a discussion about you know, uh, uh, you know, setting up a uh, like a program, new program in the uh, security management or something like that, which would, and then uh, that would not only be related to uh, homeland security or, and then there was a huge uh, 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 protest against that uh, program because some people were, because some people were just so too naive. They all thought it was, you know, uh, uh, I mean, their, their argument is, you know, uh, uh, BMCC cannot sponsor a program that would uh, <laughs> target, that would aim at terrorizing. Look, look uh, that is, if you think that is, you know, um, that program is already, that was 20 years ago and program never took off because of such a huge, you know, uh, uh, protest. But you cannot think about a world that is only flowery, right? That's full of flowers and, right? The world is not really like that. And it's inevitable. I mean, we don't want war, right? We don't want anything like that. We don't want any disease. But the fact is there's disease, there's virus, uh, there's cancer. Uh, we don't like war, but uh, the enemies, there are, you know, it's also a fact that there is a host, there are hostile enemies as well, um, sending terrorists, you know, I mean, you know, uh, self-defense, what is wrong with self-defense, right? And if you think, you know, uh, you love peace, so you don't like any type of, you know, military force, or uh, even, you know, self-defense martial art, you are being too naive, simply too naive. How can you, I don't like guns. I, I, I'm a strong su supporter of, you know, gun control, because I don't want the guns to end up in the hands of, you know, the wrong people. Uh, and uh, most, most likely, you know, uh, uh, no one with military training, right, or, uh, if you are not uh, in the uniform service, and if you are act on active duty, and even if you are a military, if you are not on active duty, you have no right to possess a gun. Okay, the gun is for only you know uh, um, if you are a military uh, using it on your duty, right? For of national uh, military service, that is official use, but you cannot, right? It's absolutely a uh, uh, you know. Uh, illegitimate it's illicit if you are carrying a gun that was you know uh, uh that is supposed to be for your you know official purpose right uh and to ca and carrying it into your civilian life that is totally you no know, uh, uh, uh outright violation of the code of you know of the conduct right so anyway uh but you know uh, one thing the reason i picked you know uh, this industry defense industry is defense industry is relatively you know uh, um uh Countercyclical, countercyclical meaning. During the peacetime, uh, the defense industry, uh, and I probably mentioned, you know, this uh, when we were talking about the muni, muni bonds, city of Bridgeport, right? Why they went bankrupt? Because you know, during the peacetime, you know, um, uh, the military defense department, you know, DoD contracts are getting slashed, right? Uh, anyway, so um, uh, think about it. We uh, most of our stocks will be uh, in our portfolio will be. Uh, uh, cyclical, but you know, if all the stocks are cyclical, uh, when uh, the business uh, economy goes up, they, your portfolio is all pulled up. But when it goes, uh, they get pulled down altogether, and nothing is uh, stopping that uh, free fall, right? So you need to have something that is, you know, uh, uh, counter cyclical, right? And uh, Mark, Pfizer, they are all pharmaceuticals. Walmart, Costco, uh, consumer retail, J.P. Morgan, City, uh, uh, what? Uh, uh, financial, right? Financial industries. Uh, CNS, uh, that is real estate, right? CNS and Abacus, uh, yeah, real estate management, right? And what are these numbers? So look at this. Uh, look at the rows and columns. You would see that the rows and columns are basically uh, repeating themselves. You know, Apple, Google, Apple, Google, Northrop Raytheon, Northrop Raytheon, Mark. You know, what what is that? Rows and columns represent. You know, uh, uh, so basically, uh, this cell, Apple and Apple, that's correlation. You know, the correlation uh, of Apple with itself. Now think about it. Self correlation. I mean, you and yourself. The correlation is one. Right? Exactly. In other words, what is what is expected in di in this diagonal? Uh, look, follow the diagonal, and you would notice that everything in the along the diagonal is one. What does that mean? Because it's uh, correlation with itself, right? But then uh, look at this: Google and Apple. It's the correlation between Apple and Google, and they are in the same industry. I mean, not exactly the same, but you know, uh, uh, related industry, similar industry, right? And as expected, if you are in the same industry, what would be the correlation? Correlation would be high, relatively, right? I mean, one is the perfect correlation, right? Negative one is perfectly uh, opposite or perfectly uh, 
uh, inversely uh, inverse correlation, right? So think of think of it this way: uh, if you have a twin, right, even an identical twin, right, they are not perfectly uh, uh, they are not perfect match. Their correlation is not uh, one because even an identical twin, uh, there's some uh, degree of you know uh, differentiation. So, uh, but you know, an identical twin would be almost like you know a, a 0 0.99, right? A correlation between the two would be 0 0.99. Uh, I, I'm only talking about the uh, the uh, appearance, right? Uh, out, the uh, outward appearance, right? In terms of, but then, um, and if you have, let's say, an evil twin, right? An evil twin, right? And uh, uh, and personality-wise, character-wise, you and your evil twin will be uh, uh, like you know, night and day, completely. You know, the, the correlation will be negative one. If you like uh, blue, he likes uh, red. If you if you like white, he likes. Uh, uh, black, or if, you know, the tastes are completely different. If you like, you know, uh, coffee, he likes, you know, uh, tea, or if you like, you know, <laughs> right? Um, so you can't agree at all. That's, you know, a complete, you know, 100%, uh, you know, inverse correlation. That would be negative one, right? So look at these highlighted cells. Basically, I uh, highlighted uh, the companies that are relatively uh, 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 little related. So the, uh, look, you know, 0 0.1 to 0 0.1. 0 0.13, they are pretty much in a 0 0.0521. This is very low correlation compared to uh, like something like you know uh, 0 0.723, right? So uh, Abacus is a real estate management. Walmart uh, is a consumer, you know, uh, uh, spending, right? Consumer uh, retail. And if you think about it, the correlation would be very low because you know uh, uh, usually you know uh, real estate management uh, uh, doesn't suffer as much as the uh, consumer retail during. Uh, an economic downturn, right? I mean, people still will have to uh, leave, uh, play, need a place to live, you know, pay rent. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, uh, if you are in a crisis, you know, of course, the first thing that would slash the uh, uh, a food, you know, budget, right? Uh, and then, you know, uh, look at the uh, also Mark and Walmart, Raytheon and Walmart, consumer retail, and you know, Pfizer, uh, uh, Mark is you know uh, pharmaceutical. Raytheon defense industry, right? And then very low correlation. I mean, even if it is uh, a Pfizer, but look at Walmart and Pfizer. Even if they are, you know, uh, Pfizer is pharmaceutical, but the correlation is not as low as correlation between Walmart and Pfizer is not as low as correlation with Mark. Why? Because uh, compared to Pfizer, Mark is more, uh, they are more, you know, like, uh, uh, you, even if it is a pharmaceutical, you've never, some of you probably haven't heard of, because Mark is more uh, into, uh, uh, they are uh, making uh, products, uh, medications for uh, fighting more, you know, uh, curing more uh, severe uh, disease, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, something like cancer or uh, <clears throat> something that is being used on, you know, like hospital level, right, clinical level. Whereas Pfizer, you know, uh, very well, uh, something like, you know, asp uh, aspirin or, you know, uh, ibuprofen or something that, uh, or, you know, um, analgesics, you know, something that are easily bought over the counter, right? That doesn't require prescription. Whereas Mark, most of the Mark's products require uh, prescription. Anyway, um, but, you know, you can buy those things, you know, like analgesics or um, ibuprofen, uh, ibuprofen or some, you know, or prescription. But, you know, most of the over the counter, they are sold in uh, Walmart, right? Makes sense. So that's why. Now, anyway, uh, but, you know, uh, this was the um, correlate. So, if you, when you construct a portfolio, you would want to uh, build the portfolio with, construct the portfolio with the uh, uh, stocks company of, of the companies that are a uh, little correlated, right, with the low correlation. And between the years 2006 to 2011, I mean, 2006 was pre-financial crisis period, right? But uh, so this was the period, you know, uh, including pre-financial crisis, uh, through financial crisis. But this is you no know, uh, period uh, including uh, during the financial crisis, right? Because financial crisis 2008. And the... Uh, uh, the recession bottomed out in, uh, officially by the uh, data only, 2010. And look at the uh, change or, over time. You now see uh, companies that are negatively correlated. What does that mean? So if the correlation is negative one, what does that mean? Uh, if company X goes up by 10% and there's a company Y that uh, that goes down by 10%. Make sense, right? So uh, this is why the diversification uh, uh, completely wipes out, you know, uh, uh, the risk of the, uh, uh, you know, a non-systematic risk of the portfolio, okay? Um, so, let's take a look at, um, so what does this, um, 
what does this uh, tell you? Uh, what does this mean? What does this uh, uh, graph showing you? First of all, uh, suppose we, uh, you are picking uh, a stock A. This is stock A, company A, and you see this is uh, basically the variance from here. Uh, uh, this is the, you know, uh, uh, this is the variation in the uh, uh, return, right? And this is the mean return. And I told you, uh, this is when you put it along the timeline, right? If you ignore the timeline, this will look like, you know, uh, uh, the normal distribution curve, right? Remember, uh, it will look like this, right? Uh, if, if you just, you know, uh, ignore the timeline and look at, you know, uh, uh, the, you know uh, the variation in returns. But if you uh, plot it along the timeline over time, it will look like this. And um, stock A, uh, if you look at stock A, stock A, uh, and let's say this is following the business cycle. So stock A uh, is a cyclical stock and it has you know, a, a wide variance, right? And this, uh, the wide variance is a risk, you know, high risk, right? Because there will be a lot of fluctuation in. Uh, now, ideally, if you can find uh, stock B, which, which is negatively, perfectly negatively correlated with uh, stock A, meaning, you know, uh, uh, correlation coefficient between the A and B is negative one, but then it will move exactly in the opposite way. When stock A goes up, stock B goes down. When stock A reaches its maximum, uh, highest point, stock B reaches its lowest point, and then uh, as A uh, goes down, right, expansion, uh, decline, expansion, shrink, um, uh, contraction, right, hitting the lowest point, and that's when uh, stock B reaches the uh, highest point, right? And then uh, expansion again, and then stock B goes into contraction, right? Well, but what are the chances of actually finding something like stock B, right? Uh, this is just only a uh, theoretical and a hypothetical situation. In reality, in, in maybe un, it's unrealistic that you can find uh, stocks, two stocks that are perfectly negatively correlated, right? And if they are perfectly negatively correlated, uh, your you know, uh, variations in return for stock A will be completely uh, offset. Right, will be completely offset by the uh, uh, variation uh, in returns of stock B. Right, that means you know uh, without any swing, without any uh, variation, if you construct a portfolio with uh, A and B only, uh, you will have a constant, constant. You will have you know uh, uh, unaffected uh, expected return, meaning you know unaffected by fluctuation in A and B. And this expected return is the portfolio expected return. In other words, you know, you construct, you know, A in uh, portfolio with 50% A, 50% B, and, you know, uh, since they are in completely uh, uh, opposite lockstep, right? Uh, this expected return will be maintained, uh, the expected return of the uh, portfolio will be maintained, but uh, at zero risk because there is no standard deviation of this portfolio, right? Because they cancel out each other. But once again, as I said, it's unrealistic to find two stocks that are completely, you know, uh, inversely correlated. So then what do you do? Uh, but in reality, you may be able to find the stock that are uh, uh, positively correlated uh, to some degree, right? Now, uh, it, so you may be able to find something like stock C. And if stock C is perfectly uh, positively correlated, uh, it will move exactly like stock A, but it is not. So maybe the correlation is something like uh, 0.5, right? Or 0.4, uh, uh, right? Then, you know, uh, uh, stock A goes ahead and you know, stock C uh, is somewhat, you know, uh, uh, like lagging behind. Right. Uh, but anyway, if you can find a stock like C, right, and find stock like uh, stock C, right, uh, then uh, if you construct a portfolio with you know A and C, then actually the uh, uh, and their you know uh, you know expected return of the portfolio is the same, but uh, the wild uh, variation, the swing in the uh, returns, will be much more tamed. In other words, uh, it will uh, return on the portfolio. Uh, the, the variance on the portfolio would uh, look more like this. In other words, uh, you see, uh, this was like, you know, uh, uh, without any, uh, uh, you know, uh, portfolio, right, composition of, you know, just stock A. But with, you know, stock A and C, the portfolio return will, uh, the variation in the portfolio return will be much more tame, right? So that's why you are uh, building a portfolio, and theoretically, okay. So um, I'm not. Um, so then, uh, let's think about it. Correlation coefficient is actually you know uh, between A and uh, uh, B, stock A and B. Uh, correlation uh, is represented by a uh, bay, uh, a row, right? A Greek character row. Here's the uh, here's the mathematical uh, thought experiment. First of all, 
what is the portfolio return? Portfolio return is the weighted average of individual stock return. Remember, uh, back here. Okay. What is the portfolio? I don't know. Uh, there must be um, a lot of flickering. In the, uh, there might be a lot of you know uh, flickering uh, in the uh, um, on the uh, on the screen. Uh, I don't know. If this is something that happens with the uh, uh, the PowerPoint. Um, but this is the uh, portfolio return. Remember uh, this example? You have you know uh, three stocks in your portfolio X, Y, and Z, right? And uh, you know they're expected returns of you know each stock, and we de determine the weight. Right, so we decided to put 33% in X, you know, 50% in Z, and so. On. And what is the uh, expected return on the portfolio? It's the weighted average, right? This times this plus this times this plus this times this, right? And then uh, that's the portfolio uh, return. Then you might wonder, also, well, then what's going to be the portfolio risk? In other words, uh, the standard deviation of the portfolio. Well, you might also think, oh, wouldn't that be a, uh, uh, wouldn't that be um, the uh, weighted average? Um, uh, yeah, but it's not that simple. It's not that simple. It's weighted. It's a kind of weighted average, uh, but it's not that simple. Why? Uh, you might think, oh, so uh, if you just, you know, uh, uh, multiply the weight of x by the standard deviation of x, and then, you know, uh, uh, plus, you know, uh, weight of y and standard deviation of y. Uh, no, uh, it's not that simple. Why? First of all, uh, you cannot have standard deviation without variance. I mean, you know, remember when we calculated standard deviation, we started out uh, with the uh, a variance. So think about it. So let's assume the standard deviation of portfolio, uh, a variance of the portfolio is, you know, this is the way you can write variance. Why? You know, remember, sigma is, uh, you know, a symbol for uh, standard deviation, and this uh, subscript P st stands for uh, portfolio. So it's the uh, standard deviation of portfolio. But then squared, what does that mean? Uh, standard deviation squared is the variance, right? So um, how do you uh, find the variance of the portfolio? Well, uh, then it's weight of X times standard deviation of X uh, plus weight of Y times standard deviation of Y. And you might think, oh, that must be the uh, standard deviation of portfolio. No, uh, you, you have to uh, uh, first, you know, uh, find variance, right? So this is basically, you know, uh, then variance of the portfolio. And then we will need to, uh, we will need to uh, uh, expand it, right? Uh, why do we do it this way? Because can we not just, you know, uh, add up, you know, uh, uh, this and this? No. Why? Because between X and Y, there might be some, there would be some correlation. X and Y are not uh, uh, perfect. I mean, if there is zero correlation, right, between X and Y, you can do just this, right? Zero correlation means, you know, uh, but all the, every, you know, uh, industry is, in to some extent, uh, is correlated with one another, you know, um, to a greater or to a lesser degree. So because of the correlation between the two, you cannot simply add them up like that. We need to uh, factor in the correlation. So, and there are, uh, you know, interactions between the uh, two uh, uh, industries, right? So how do we expand it? You probably learned this in, you know, uh, a very, you know, intermediate, uh, you know, elementary algebra, right? This is something you will learn in like, you know, sixth, uh, seventh grade. I think. Um, so X plus Y squared is what? X squared plus two XY plus Y squared, isn't that right? Yes. And what is, you know, uh, 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 to x y uh, x y x times y is the uh, you know uh, uh, intersection between x and y. In other words, there's a uh, uh, you know, uh, the intervening effect, right, into uh, between each other, right. And as long as and x and y are random variables, so there is a correlation between the two. So uh, we we um, if x and y are not random variables, you just do it like that. But if x and y are random variables, then uh, we have to uh, uh, factor in the correlation between x and y. This is Greek character rho. Of course, rho stand for would stand for uh, relation, right? Rho, uh, the correlation between x and y. So actually, uh, uh, to correlate x rho x y correlation between x and y is defined uh, this way. If you did uh, statistics, you would. It's the covariance between x and y and standard deviation of x and uh, times standard deviation of y. Now. Uh, and the correlation, we know it's between one, negative one and one, right? Zero being uh, no correlation whatsoever. So uh, let's assume that the uh, uh, the weight in each asset, X and Y, weight and, are both, you know, 50%, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And let's say standard deviation between the two is also uh, standard deviation of X is 0 0.5, standard deviation of Y is 0 0.5. I'm just to that, you know. Then if we expand it, then it's going to be, uh, and, co and also assume further, correlation coefficient is 0 0.5, right? What a wonderful... Uh, I mean, you know, uh, 
uh, correlation coefficient is negative one. Correlation coefficient is negative one, meaning you know x and y are perfectly inversely correlated. When x goes up, uh, ten percent y goes down by exactly ten percent. X goes down by twenty percent y goes up by exactly twenty percent. So if that's the case, right? Let's think about it. Um, if we expand it, right? Uh, let's do that. Weight of x squared is. 0 0.25. Why? Because it's 0.5 times 0.5, right? 0.5 times 0.5 is 0 0.25. And this is also uh, 0 0.25, standard deviation of x, right? Uh, so uh, 0.25 times 0.25, so 0.25 squared. And then plus 2 times 0.5 times 0.5, so 0.25, right? Times 0.5 times 0.5. So what's that? 0.25. So it's all uh, 0.25 squared. And then this is negative 1. So what does that mean? This becomes negative 2, right? This becomes, you know, a uh, uh, I mean, this becomes, you know, a negative, uh, uh, negative, uh, uh, negative 0 0.25 squared. And because it's uh, times 2, it's going to be 2 times negative uh, 2 times 0.25 uh, squared. I mean, this whole thing. And then finally, um, the weight of y squared, 0.25, uh, standard deviation of y squared, 0.25. So what do you see? This and this is 2 times 0.25 squared. Isn't that right? And then this is uh, negative 2 times uh, 0 0.25 squared. So what happens? They cancel out each other. They cancel out, perfectly cancel out each other, right? That, then the variance of the portfolio becomes zero. That means, you know, uh, uh, that's why if you construct a portfolio with perfectly negatively correlated and uh, under, you know, this restrictive assumption, their weights are the same, weights are 0 0.5, 0 0.5, standard deviation point, then they will perfectly, you know, uh, cancel out each other. So that means you will, uh, you get the uh, expected return with no variation, you know, uh, in uh, uh, distribution of returns. It's going to be always not point right? So this is basically uh, uh, the role of the uh, uh, correlation coefficient. Okay, makes sense. So therefore, that explains. Now, why, that's why it makes our um, portfolio uh, diversify away the uh, non-systematic uh, risk part of our portfolio. And then, um, in uh, but then what about the uh, systematic risk part? I mean, it, it doesn't get diversified away. So uh, what do you do? What do you need to do? Well, then. Um, since we cannot diversify away the, uh, the systematic risks, uh, then we will have to uh, uh, exploit the, uh, uh, because it is coming from the systematic risk is coming from the uh, macroeconomic system and the financial market, we will need to uh, uh, react accordingly to how the market moves. So we need to uh, find the uh, correlation between the, uh, uh, the stock market and individual stock, right? And then the uh, correlate, you just, you know, heard, oh, the correlation is me measured by a row. Uh, 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 yes, that's between, uh, it's a little different story. That's between the uh, random variables, right, in uh, individual stocks. But when it is between the market and individual stocks, the correlation is measured by beta, okay? Beta is you know, like alpha beta, right? And um, beta is, uh, uh, basically beta is the, uh, the slope coefficient in a uh, linear function, okay? They say uh, beta measures the uh, uh, market risk or the volatility Right. That means you know how much you know um, uh, how much uh, how much correlation is there between this particular individual stock X and the market. And if this the correlation between the uh, market and the stock is two, that means when market goes up by uh, uh, ten percent, the stock goes up by twenty percent. When market goes down by ten percent, the stock goes down by twenty uh, percent. Uh, and if the beta, the correlation between the market and the stock is uh, if that is two. And if it is negative two, then the opposite happens, right? When market goes up by 10%, the stock goes down by 20% and vice versa. But then, uh, so I said before, I explained that, you know, uh, uh, if a stock has a wide variance, that means, you know, uh, uh, it's more, stock is more volatile. But at the time, I told you there is a, uh, uh, actually, you know, uh, uh, strictly it is different. Volatility and the uh, variance is different. And I explained uh, at the time when I, uh, when we discussed the uh, uh, variance that uh, they, they, use the word interchangeably they use um uh, as if they uh confuse the these two words the variance and the uh, uh volatility as if you know, uh, in uh, actually everyday language you know i mean it's a stock market language you know they use the term volatility actually to mean variance right and they they are using it in confusion why actually uh volatility is part of the uh that variance that is due to the correlation with the market okay but you understand uh uh, the variance is not, uh, if you're looking at the uh, uh, variance, 
of the uh, individual stock, right? Then uh, you can separate uh, the part of the variance that comes from the uh, correlation with the market and uh, uh, the other part, non-systematic risk that can be divers uh, diversified away. But once, uh, so, but when you construct a portfolio, and if the uh, portfolio is well constructed, meaning you know all the uh, uh, all the uh, uh, non-systematic risk is diversified away, then the only risk remaining is the uh, systematic risk. So, and you can say uh, the variance is mainly due to volatility. So you can use the term uh, interchangeably. But un uh, unless that's the case, uh, it's not right to uh, uh, equate these two words. Okay. Now, but why is it called beta, and how is it different from rho? Now, in, the, in this one lecture, I'm trying to, uh, 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 I'm trying to, uh, you know, cram in, you know, uh, as much. Uh, this is more advanced, um, uh, more advanced topic, but it's just one hour session. But you know, I have to cram in every, cram everything into this one hour, which should normally be covered over like many hours, like you know, at least three to four hours. So that's very difficult, but you know, uh, bear with me because you know we are at the end of the semester, and uh, this is the uh, uh, practically the uh, last lecture of uh, the semester. So uh, it might be a little, you know, a, a longer session. Now, why beta? You remember, uh, beta is um, the slope co coefficient in a uh, uh, linear function. What's a linear function? You remember, you probably did this type of exercise in uh, middle school, right? Uh, this is a graph of y equals 3.5. Uh, x. In other words, this is a um, uh, linear function because what does that mean? Linear function means you know whatever uh, x, whatever value x takes, right? Uh, y is determined by uh, the coefficient between x and y and the uh, x value. That means uh, what is this? This is the correlation coefficient between x and y. And the correlation coefficient means you know when x if x is one, uh, y will be 3.5. If x is two, y will be seven. X is three, y will be three point you know whatever. Right, that will be 10.5 something. Like X is five, you know. You can. So in other words, uh, y value depends on the coefficient and correlation coefficient and x. In other words, the correlation between x and y is whatever happens to x. 3.5 times x will happen to y. Right, makes sense. That's what. And this correlation is uh, one o runs only one direction. It's a unidirectional, one direction. It runs only one direction. Me meaning, the correlation runs from x to y, not the other way around. Right, makes sense. So uh, this is the difference between beta and rho. In rho, uh, if if the correlation between x and y is uh, uh, 3.5, uh, I mean uh, the direction can be both ways, right? Uh, x can be you know 3.5 times y. Y can be, I mean, um, uh, it runs both ways, right? It runs both ways. Correlation is both ways, right? Uh, uh, but in this case, uh, so in other words. Uh, x, that's why in this case, x is the uh, independent variable. x varies independently, right? It doesn't depend, change in x doesn't depend on y. But y is called a dependent variable because uh, a change in y is caused only by change in x. Make sense? It's almost like, you know, change in x causing change in y, right? And then uh, think about it, that if x is zero, y is also zero, right? Um, and this exercise, through this exercise, you would know that uh, all these coordinates all these coordinates, right, between x and y, fall nicely and neatly on a straight line. If, in other words, if you connect these dots, right, it is exactly a straight line, right? Makes sense. Starting from the origin, right, going through the origin. But is that the reality? No, that's not the reality, right? That's not the reality. Why? What does that? In other words, in this case, you, this coefficient coefficient was pre-given, right? So it was already given. 3.5 was given. Then uh, x is given. So all you need to do is just plug in and you know, plug x into uh, this linear function, right? Uh, it's called linear function. It's a function in, in uh, line format, right? Linear, it just goes linear. So uh, you put $1 into it and $3.5 $3 come out, you know, you put $2, $7 come out, right? Um, it is uh, because in this example, and this is what, you, you know, you uh, at least, you know, I did in uh, like, you know, middle school, right? That was, uh, like you know, uh, seventh grade, right? That was very, very you know, uh, 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 elementary uh, algebra. Uh, but it is once again. So it is uh, very artificial, artificial. What that means is, you know, uh, uh, the correlation was already given. It was predetermined correlation, and then, then according to this correlation, everything will fall neatly on, neatly on a straight line. But that's not the reality. What is the reality? 
Um, reality is more like this. In other words, nobody knows what the uh, correlation coefficient is. It's not given, right? It's not given at the beginning. It's not uh, given to begin with. In reality, what you see to understand the correlation is starting from the uh, coordinates between, you know, uh, uh, stock X and stock M. M is what? M is the market. M stands for the market, right? In other words, you know, uh, uh, the average return on the market. And X is an individual stock. Remember, uh, the, uh, and the horizontal axis is the uh, independent variable, right? And the vertical axis is the uh, uh, dependent variable. And if you think about it, uh, between the uh, market return, average re uh, return on the market, and the uh, individual stock's return, which one is independent variable and which one is dependent variable? Hmm? Don't you think, the, uh, uh, isn't that the market? Isn't it obvious? Why? Individual stock cannot affect the market, right? No matter during a uh, like a severe recession and you know economic downturn, just because Apple does well, individual stock Apple may do well, Amazon may do well, but just because an individual company does well, extremely well, you know, Amazon is doing extremely well, it cannot pull up the entire market, right? But when market falls altogether, when the market crashes, you know, as a whole, almost every individual stock is also adversely affected and they are being pulled down too. You cannot, when the market goes down, you cannot, uh, as a whole, um, there is not a single stock that can resist, right? Of course, you know, when, as I told you, there, there may be a stock that is negatively correlated with the market. And I, I told you it's called counter-cyclical stock, right? And a counter-cyclical stock may uh, move in the opposite direction. Okay, so this is, once again, uh, another way of, you know, uh, uh, I mean, between individual stocks, yeah, you can minimize, you know, by diversifying because the correlations, different correlations would, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, cancel off, cancel out uh, the you know, variation in the portfolio. Now, uh, but, you know, the still systematic uh, risk remains. What about the systematic, uh, the, and the measure of the correlation, you know, correlation with systematic correlation is beta. So that means if you construct a portfolio with varying degrees of beta, right, then at least you can tame, right, the volatility, meaning, you know, uh, uh, you can tame uh, the fluctuation of the uh, uh, variation uh, stemming from uh, the correlation with the market, right? Makes sense? So then the uh, question is, you know, uh, this line isn't given. Think about it. Nobody, you are given. I mean, when you are, when you have a data, right, uh, and you plot, this is called basically scatter plot. Why? Because you plot the uh, this data. In other words, what does this uh, dot mean? That means when a market return is this level, right, uh, what is the uh, stock X's return? Stock X's return is this level. That's what it means, right? All of these dots are coordinates between market's return and uh, the uh, individual stock's return, okay? So, <clears throat> um, I, I was hoping to uh, uh, be able to uh, um, <laughs> uh, cram it within one hour, but it seems like it's going to take longer than an hour. So maybe at some point I will uh, stop the video and uh, uh, maybe, you know, uh, put an additional uh, uh, smaller video, like maybe 30 minutes. Maybe let me, but then let me do this. Let me take care of, uh, actually, I'm recording this in the middle of a class. So, um, Okay, let, uh, let me do this. Uh, so, okay, let me, uh, so let me wrap this, uh, let me uh, cut the video here and uh, let me uh, uh, start a new video because the uh, file size is getting too large and it's gonna be very difficult to upload. Um, okay, I'll see you guys in the next class, okay? Uh, or next segment of the video, okay? All right. So, uh, uh, any questions so far? Any questions? Basically, I've been talking about the uh, uh, correlation, right? Correlation between the uh, 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 independent variable and the uh, dependent variable, and obviously, independent uh, individual stocks return is correlated with uh, the market's return. And between the two, market is the independent variable. In other words, uh, 
market has more impact on the uh, 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 on the uh, individual stock rather than because no individual stock cannot uh, independently uh, pull up or pull down the entire market, right? So it's quite obvious that the uh, uh, market is the uh, independent uh, variable. The market return is, you know, uh, a random variable, right? And the independent, uh, the individual stocks return is also a random variable. However, there is a correlation between the two, and that's, you know, what I've been, you know, explaining. But the uh, correlation can be captured uh, this way by the uh, scatter plot, right? And if the scatter plot, uh, we can, you know, see, uh, we can identify certain trend from the scatter plot. Obviously, there's an uh, uh, upward, right? There's a trend that's going from uh, going upward as we go from zero to, you know, more positive values, right? Also, uh, so that's an upward trend. Obviously, nobody would see a downward trend here, right? And then from this scatter plot, how do we identify this uh, trend uh, trend line? In other words, you know, uh, a slope of this slope coefficient of this uh, line, trend line. That's what we are going to be talking about in the next uh, video. But uh, any questions so far? Any questions? Any questions? Okay, I would say, uh, uh, okay, no, uh, uh, it seems like uh, no questions. So I'm going to be, uh, let's go to the next one, the final video, right? And so if we can finish this, we'll be able to finish this today, tomorrow. Uh, we'll have a uh, big, you know, uh, question and answer session. Okay. All right. So let's go. Um, hello. Uh, welcome back. Continuing our discussion about the uh, uh, the uh, how we measure the risk, especially the systematic risk. Right. So our last discussion was uh, basically we. Uh, uh, we left off where um, I was showing you this scatter <coughs> scatter plot between the uh, uh, two variables, uh, and uh, one being the uh, the market return, and the other being the the return on a particular uh, stock of company X, right? And um, so um, uh, this scatter plot. Uh, each dot in this scatter plot represents the coordinates, right, between, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> market return and the return on the uh, company X, right? And I said, uh, uh, basically, the reason we are uh, looking at this scatter plot is because the scatter plot would give us some clue as to whether there is some correlation between the market and this particular company X, right? And I've been telling you. Um, if there is any correlation, right, the correlation would be either positive, uh, zero, or negative, right? With the zero <clears throat> correlation, meaning you know, there's absolutely no correlation whatsoever. And that uh, correlation is captured by the trend line, because uh, if, if you see a scatter plot like this, and approximately, right, you can, um, you can see that there's a trend, right? And the trend is upsloping, right? It is uh, going, um, in an upward trend, right? Um, well, I don't have other picture, but if the scatter plot shows, uh, if the scatter plot looks like this, that shows a downward trend, right? But, and if there is no identifiable trend, that, like you know, uh, the plus, the dots are all over, right? With no uh, particular trend, uh, identifiable um, trend, right? And that's that means there's no correlation. In this example, uh, these uh, plots uh, form an upward trend. Right or an upsloping trend, right? So we want to uh, identify basically, you know, uh, uh, a trend line, right? I mean, not just you know, uh, um, because everything is kind of you know just look. We, there's you know some identifiable trend, but uh, without any uh, particular, without any uh, uh, specific line that captures the uh, the the uh, gist 
or the spirit of the trend, to put it that way, um, without any particular line. And it's just a, like a, you know, a, a nebulous idea, right? Just cloudy, foggy idea. So we have to capture uh, the best fitting line, right? The line that would uh, represent uh, that trend best, right? So that's called best fitting line. And that is what, uh, and uh, if we find, and if we can identify such a line, the line will be uh, represented by two characteristics. One is the slope of the line, slope, and the slope is called beta. Isn't it what uh, we were talking about last time, right? Uh, in a linear function, what does the linear function mean? Linear function basically represents the uh, correlation between x and y. Isn't that right? And what determines that correlation is the correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient, in this in this case, 3.5, which means you know, uh, whatever x is, right, whatever the x value is, uh, y value depends on that uh, x and the correlation coefficient. So if x is 2, right, uh, y will be 7 in this, you know, and if it's, if x is 0, y will be 0. If x is 20, y will be 70. If x is 15, right, y will be uh, 52.5. So uh, <clears throat> basically one characteristic that would uh, uh, capture the, uh, or represent uh, the characteristics of the line trend, uh, is the slope coefficient. And that slope is generally called beta, right? Um, and as I said in the um, previous example, this was, you know, uh, uh, the, the coefficient was already given. In other words, you know, uh, in this example, uh, slope was given uh, and the vertical impact was already given as zero. And then uh, because you already have uh, deterministic trend uh, coefficient, um, all the uh, dots, all the uh, plots would fall neatly and perfectly neatly on a straight line, right? Because the line didn't, the plot didn't exist uh, before. The plot wasn't there before. The, uh, the equation of the line was there before, and the plot is the result of the uh, uh, equation of the line. But I, I've been telling you, reality is like that. Nobody, in reality, uh, the equation of the line isn't given ahead. You understand? Um, and what uh, what you're trying to do, what we're trying to do is to identify this equation of the line from what? From the uh, uh, scatter plot that is uh, given ahead. The scatter plot is the result of our observation. We looked at the uh, market return over the last five yearly returns, and uh, each time when <clears throat> market return was a certain level, what was the uh, matching uh, uh, corresponding uh, company X's return level, right, for each level of market return, and uh, each dot represents that. So these dots were given before the equation of the line. No equation of the line is given, and we are trying to uh, figure out, right, we are trying to uh, 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 identify this line, trend line, from the given data. Okay, so the uh, uh, the process is actually <clears throat> um, reversed. You understand from the uh, uh, middle school example, seventh grade example of you know linear function. You are given the equation of the line, and you just plug in the numbers, and you get the y values. You know uh, that is the middle school way, right? Grown up way is not like that because grown up, for, uh, you know, if you are in a uh, like you know uh, Goldman Sachs, you know, uh, uh, doing the research for uh, the Sachs, right? You're trying to find the uh, beta basically. Why? Because this gives you a uh, deterministic trend. Why? For example, if you have this trend line, if you know this trend line, and you identify, as I said, you know, the trend line by two character, uh, two characteristics or two properties. One is the slope of the line, right, which is beta, and the vertical intercept, alpha. The other one is alpha. Where is the alpha? Right? Where does it cut the uh, vertical axis? And <clears throat> so if you know the uh, uh, trend line, then what can you do? You can forecast. You can make a forecast. Why? Oh, well, then, you know, um, the uh, market return is something like this. Uh, let's say this is like, you know, uh, 15%. What if the uh, market return is 15%? And let's say this slope of the trend line is um, 2. It's not 2. It looks more like not even 1. But uh, because why? If it is 1, if the trend line is 1, if the slope is 1, what do you see? Uh, you will see a perfectly 45-degree line. 45-degree. Why? Because if the uh, beta is 1, slope is 1, when x is 1, y will be 1 as well. I mean, ignore the, uh, ignore the alpha. Alpha uh, let's say vertical intercept is zero, then, you know, because there's a, if slope is one, there, there will be a perfect symmetry between X and Y. Because there will be a perfect symmetry, then, you know, uh, 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 the line will show a perfectly uh, 45 degree angle. Uh, this isn't even 45 degrees, it looks like something like 30 degree angle. Um, so I can say, uh, just based on this uh, graphic representation, the slope cannot be even one, but let's say the slope is two. If the slope is, two, and if market return was 20%, what can you tell about the uh, stock's uh, return? The stock's return would be, if this is 20%, and this point will be like 40%, right? Two times, you know, 20%, right? And of course, um, 
It may not always be true because out of all these plots, how many of those dots fall exactly on the trend line? Not too many. There's something close, something close. This falls almost on the line. Uh, this falls almost on the line. This falls exactly on the line, close to the line. Uh, so <clears throat> there's no way uh, everything will fall exactly on the line. That can only happen only like in the middle school, right? When you already have, um, right? That's an amateur, right? But when you already have the equation of the line and uh, there are no, uh, it's not like you're, so this is like, deductive or inductive, right? Deductive approach or inductive approach. This is a deductive approach. In other words, you have the, uh, the guiding principle. You have the equation of the line. So then you plug in the number, you you plug in the X value, you get the uh, Y value, and everything will fall neatly on the, uh, uh, you know, uh, line, straight line. But this is inductive approach. You understand? It's inductive, meaning uh, from the given data set, right? From the given data set, you are trying to uh, find uh, a uh, hypothesis or theory would govern this this phenomenon. Make sense? So that is more grown-up approach, right? Uh, children can do that. In other words, uh, some, uh, I'm not saying deductive approach is uh, inferior. Uh, it, it's more, you know, uh, it's as you know uh, uh, difficult as you know uh, inductive approach. But uh, what is this? The, uh, this. This example is a, a case where you already have a theory. You already have a formula, or you know, a theory that a formula that you know um, uh, implements the theory. So all you need to do is then you know uh, plug in the data, and you get x data, and you will get y value, right? Um, if the theory already exists, then you can do that. But uh, what we are trying to do there is you know uh, uh, there is no theory, but from the given data, you're trying to formulate a theory. You understand? So if the theory is already given, just uh, implementing the theory is something even a seventh grader can do. You get you plug in the number x value, you get the y values, right? Okay, but this is not, not something a seventh grader can do. You understand? This is you know only people with grown up intelligence. Uh, you're saying, oh, I'm, you know, we're all grown. No, not uh, at your you know um, how many of you? I mean, if you follow this, then I would say, okay, then you have a grown ups. Uh, a brain and grown-ups way of thinking. And if you're still struggling, you know, uh, uh, getting what this is all about, then your intellect is not on that level yet. Okay, but I've been trying to put it into as plain a language as possible, hoping that the majority of you would, you know, uh, get it. And I'm uh, pretty much sure, you know, uh, at least more than, you know, 50% uh, is getting it. <clears throat> so this is more of a uh, thing to do, right? And if you're working in, uh, for Goldman Sachs and if you're in a research department, or you know, even if you're not in a research department, uh, <clears throat> security analysts would do this, right? They would find, okay, so uh, what is the uh, beta and what would be the alpha? And that would give you the power to uh, uh, predict or forecast, right? What if the market uh, return is something like this? What should be the, uh, right, uh, X value, company X's return? <clears throat> and of course, <clears throat> this process is called regression, right? Linear regression. And then, uh, uh, of course, forecast isn't the actual, uh, uh, right, for example, uh, in this case, uh, there is only one. Uh, <clears throat> there is only one data plot that, uh, uh, for this point, right, when the uh, X is, I mean, the market return is this, right? The uh, company uh, stock X return is uh, estimated or forecasted or predicted to be this. I mean, they all mean the same thing: estimated, projected, forecasted, and predicted. They all mean the same. Thing. This is, in other words, projected. Uh, but then the reality may be different. Right, because it because we are using the past data, you can tell the past has already happened. So in the past, when X was this uh, here, right? Let's say when X was uh, at this level, I mean market return was this level. Uh, what happened in reality was uh, X stock X return was actually this. Or uh, even here in the past, when X was this level, stock I mean market was uh, market return was this level. Stock X's return had three different variations, right? At one point it was like this, another point it was like this. So in other words, reality. Uh, uh, was different, and in the future it may be different. But it is the uh, given given the past data. This is the uh, uh, best we can rationally forecast. This is the best uh, projection you can rationally make. Understand? So in other words, forecast may not exactly nail it, but at least it it is better than nothing, and it's rationally the best. Rationally, right? Based. So our next question. So that's what we want to find. You know. Uh, so 
the beta, and then alpha. And how do we do that? Uh, we use a technique called le uh, OLS, ordinary least square, which is a uh, regression technique, uh, which is you know, a statistical method. So in this class, uh, we have uh, limitations to do that. But you know, uh, you will be uh, if you have time. I'm gonna uh, uh, show you. Uh, but uh, it will be a uh, uh, running a regression will be uh, uh, for beta and alpha will be uh, discussed in the uh, uh, finance 300. Now, but you know, uh, uh, mathematically and statistically, uh, beta, how do you calculate beta? Uh, the formula for beta is covariance between x and y and variance over variance of x. And uh, statistic, uh, and with the uh, uh, Greek characters, it's, you understand what this is, you know, this is standard deviation. This is what? Uh, variance, right? Variance is a square term of the uh, standard deviation, right? If there's no uh, squared right here, uh, sigma x is a standard deviation of x, and then sigma x squared is a variance of x, right? Now, you need to understand what covariance is. Uh, I'm going to get to that uh, later, but don't you, doesn't this remind you of something? Hmm? What does that remind you of? Um, you remember rho? What did I say? What, what was rho? Rho is the correlation, correlation coefficient between uh, two random variables, x and y. And you might wonder, oh, isn't it the same thing? Aren't we talking about x and y? No, here, the difference is, um, although I use x and y, uh, and x being the, uh, but the difference is, uh, here, x is the market return, and y is the individual stocks return. What's the difference? Remember, um, we are, uh, what is a linear function? Linear function is not an equal, uh, relate, not about an equal relationship between x and y. x and y are not, oh, x, what, what is that? Uh, x is the uh, independent variable, remember? And y is the dependent variable. Why is that called dependent variable? Because y cannot vary on its own, right? Y cannot change on its own. You understand? The change in y is a result of change in x. That's why x is called independent variable, meaning x vary independently on its own, right? X is a random variable that changes on its own, whereas y is a variable, uh, and the change in y uh, dependent on x. So the uh, change in y is a result of change in x. Uh, x causes change in x causes change in y. Okay, that is a linear function, right? In linear function, y doesn't cause change in x, right? Dependent variable cannot cause change in x. Uh, but, you know, uh, independent variable causes change in the dependent variable. So, the, if you think about it, um, and I've been telling you, the market is a very, uh, market is a formidable force, right? Um, no company is free from the market. The market goes down, uh, it takes down um, all of this altogether, all companies uh, together. In other words, that's the macroeconomic system, isn't it, right? If the economy is going into recession, all, most companies are also going into recession. And I've been telling you, most companies are cyclical. Most businesses are cyclical. They go together with the business cycle, follow the business cycle. And uh, during the boom, companies uh, <clears throat> do well. During the uh, downturn, companies do poorly, right? All do, and, uh, although, I said, there are some counter-cyclical stocks, right, that move, move against the market. So that's why we've been trying to nail down this correlation between the uh, uh, market and particular stock. But also, we talked about already, we already talked about correlation between uh, 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 X and Y. In other words, in that case, X is not the uh, market, but it's X is a company, Y is another, Y is another company. And the correlation between the two is not one. Uh, I didn't. It's not one way. It's it runs both ways. The correlation runs both ways. Remember that. <clears throat> Why? Because uh, we talked about that because of the uh, uh, non-systemic, uh, unsystematic risk. Because unsystematic risk can be diversified away, right? The diversification, portfolio diversification uh, uh, minimizes, right? Right. The uh, unsystematic risk, so uh, uh, the, you know, drastically, you know, the portfolio risk uh, drastically drops. But what goes down is the uh, uh, through diversification is the unsystematic risk. And I told you, systematic risk still remains. And the reason the uh, unsystematic risk uh, is going down drastically is because uh, of the correlation between um, these you know, 20, 15 to 20 stocks that are all, you know, in a very low. Uh, if you construct them, <clears throat> the low correlation uh, or high correlation, uh, negative correlation, they all uh, cancel out each other, right? Uh, so. Uh, the rho is the correlation, right? Uh, um, okay, so where did I put the... Uh, but then, uh, how you calculate the rho, right? Here, I uh, explained that. You see this? All right, uh, so I was, I'm explaining the difference between beta and rho, right? Uh, rho is spelled R-H-O, Greek character rho, right? Which is uh, like this. And because they are both correlation coefficients, how are they different? So I'm explaining that here. 
But however, the time is 7.15 and this is the right time to take a break. So let, let us take a 10 minute break and reconvene at 7.25, okay? All right, let's take a 10.
All right, we're back. We're back. Um, so let's let's continue, right, with the uh, um, the discussion about the uh, comparison between beta and rho. Okay. I you saw that before, right? And there, covariance. Well, that, at the time, it was covariance between x and y, and standard deviation of x and standard deviation of y. Remember this, right? Remember this. That's correlating coefficient of x and y. In this case, what is the difference between rho and beta? If you remember what was there in beta, uh, numerator is the same. It's the covariance between x and y. But at the bottom, in the denominator, it was not the standard deviation of x and standard deviation of y. It was variance of x, right? It's the variance of x. So <clears throat> that means uh, x is the, the independent variable, right? But in case of... Uh, uh, they are both independent, right? So instead of, you know, uh, 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 variance of x, then there was you know, standard deviation of x and standard deviation of y. But think about it. What's the difference? I mean, stand, uh, variance of x is what? Uh, standard deviation of x times standard deviation of x. So look, it's still variance, right? Uh, rho, uh, in case of rho, it's still the same thing. The only difference is that instead of sigma x times sigma x, at, rho has... Uh, sigma x times sigma y. Make sense? Okay, so that's the difference between um, rho and beta. Uh, also, intuitively, uh, rho is the correlation between two uh, companies, x and y, and beta is the correlation between uh, uh, a company and the market. Market is x in this case, because x is the uh, independent variable. Uh, company is y, because uh, the company is in, uh, a dependent variable, right? So, uh, by running a regression, I mean, you can calculate it uh, to, anyway, to calculate covariance and variance, you need to uh, uh, do this anyway. So um, uh, as long as you have to uh, calculate all the, uh, uh, you do this, you have uh, generate a you know, difference term, your data table of difference terms and you know, uh, square difference terms and things like that. Uh, as long as you have to do that, it's better to uh, simply run the regression. And if you run the regression, so here between Apple, that was, um, and this sample was this, uh, this example was taken in, um, I believe, uh, several uh, uh, semesters ago. So this is not the uh, most current one, but based on the, uh, uh, yeah, 2015, look at this, you know, between uh, five years, between, you know, um, and I truncated in the middle, see? Because, of course, there's no way you can put uh, 60 months, you know, five years data, monthly data, but there will be 60 data points. I cannot put it in a slide, right? So I truncated in the middle, right? So you see uh, the missing values. Missing values are from, you know, uh, July of 2011 all the way to June of 2015. So it's truncated, right? Uh, it, it's only visible in you know, X. Uh, and then, uh, so that based on that uh, time period, uh, 2010 through 2000, uh, 2011 through 2015, and the, uh, uh, then Apple's beta, and there's no uh, Apple's beta, Apple's beta was, you know, 0 0.87. So I've been tracking Apple, I've been tracking Apple since like 2000, seven or 2005 so i have you know uh, enough data uh accumulated over uh like you know, uh, 15 years at least and then as i have watched apple over you know for uh, every five-year period every semester right uh, apple's beta has drastically changed uh early on around 2007 you know apple's beta was greater than uh, one right it was like 1.5 and then towards the uh, uh, later part of 2000, now uh, beta is even 2019, Apple's beta is almost about uh, 0 0.8. Um, so what does that mean? Beta can have three uh, uh, ranges of values it can take. Also, uh, so can rho, rho can take three, you know, uh, remember positive, zero, negative, right? And uh, in case of beta, right, can be positive and greater than one. Right, greater than one. What does that mean? So suppose beta is two. What does that mean? If beta is two. That means when market goes up by ten percent, right? Uh, Apple, uh, the stock. Uh, you know, let's say Apple. If Apple's beta is two, what does it mean? Apple's uh, return goes up by twenty percent. The correlation uh, coefficient is giving you that uh, power. Predict, you know, power of forecasting. Predictive power, right? In other words, uh, how rational and scientific and how powerful this is. When when you say, you know. Uh, when you when the news media interview the uh, uh, experts, right? Uh -huh. So what do you think this is? You know, uh, 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 what will be the uh, magnitude of you know increase or decrease? You know, how's how uh, the sales going to uh, change? You know, you think uh, Apple's been doing well, so for the last you know, how much you know uh, uh, the revenue will increase? Do you uh, uh, expect? And if um, those executives are being or uh, researchers being 
uh, interviewed, right, are saying, um, based on the model, you know, I think, you know, Apple's, well, based on the model, what model? This is the model, right? And if you're a trained finance professional, trained uh, economist, if you're trained uh, mathematician, trained statistician, statisticians, trained uh, uh, physicist, you can base it on the model. And this is, you know, based on the, uh, based on the data, uh, best, uh, the best forecast we can uh, uh, formulate, best projection we can formulate. But if you go to a, a store manager and, you know, uh, what do you think, you know, uh, uh, Apple go to, uh, go to an Apple store and, you know, ask the store manager, uh, uh, how, how much do you think sales is going to, uh, sales are going to increase next quarter? Say, so, you know, uh, the best they can say is based on my experience. And otherwise, you know, if it is not based on their experience, it's just a wild guess. Even if it is just based on their experience, it's still uh, not a rational expectation. It's just a, uh, right, uh, a gut feeling, hunch, right? There's a, a difference between science and just wild guess. You understand? And, and it's not, it doesn't carry any weight. If the uh, Apple store manager says, you know, uh, well, I guess it's going to uh, go up by 20%. Most likely, maybe, I mean, I'm not denying or I'm not, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, belittling or declining their experience. I mean, uh, their experience has something, you know, uh, obviously based on, you know, uh, uh, past uh, uh, performance. So, uh, but then it is, that's not a, uh, a forecast based, a uh, uh, scientific model, right? You understand? That's the difference between a trained people, uh, educated people and uh, untrained people. Training is very important. You think, uh, some people think, on, on college, you know, I'm finding some a lot of uh, some complaints from some students who are more on a very emotional side, and they are just you know uh, uh, crying all the time, complaining all the time. They don't do their duties, just they don't do their due diligence, but just when they are chided and um, reproached, then they just complain. You are adding stress, blah 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 blah. That because they are lacking, and who are they talking to? Huh? It is I'm the professor, and it is the part of. The responsibility of the professor to chide and reproach if you are if the students are not doing things in the right way and also uh, so role of the trainer i mean um, think about it this is a rigorous training this is not a uh, touchy-feely you know uh, uh you know uh, psychology or literature i mean um <clears throat> you know uh it, you are you are not a don't, you know, uh, the students are complaining, they cannot uh, stand up like a grown-up. A grown-up is what? Who can, someone who can handle their own emotional state, who can, you know, uh, control, or at least, you know, um, uh, who should be able to uh, tell the difference between, you know, uh, what, uh, what is the professional attitude and what is not. But then uh, this comes from a training. I mean, training means you no know, uh, rigor, right? R training is cannot be a, in a training. If you underperform, you get you get reproached. It's better to be reproached than penalized. You understand? If you get reproached, at least you don't get penalized. But some people think they are adults and they cannot handle their own uh, emotional state and just you know uh, uh, blow up. Um, I mean, not only, it's not because of uh, the matter at the core, right? In other words, they just complain because it's hard for them. And if it is hard, it, this is a training. You, uh, The goal is, the bar is set above you. The bar is, it cannot be set below you. If the bar is set below you, that's not a training. You don't achieve anything. If anything is, the bar is below you, then uh, even a second grader can do anything. Right? All, always the bar is set above or at a challenging level for that for that core group. Right? And in a training you get so think about a, a military boot camp. Are they pampering in the military boot you're if you're in the military, are you uh, there to get pampered? Mm -hmm. This is the same thing. This is you know, uh, the same thing as you know intellectual military boot camp. This is the same thing uh, to martial arts intellectual martial arts you have to really you know treat yourself harsh right like a son training if you think you're you know, in a military boot camp you're you think you will have a party you know uh they will pamper you with ice cream and you know uh, uh strawberry and you know uh, champagne 
and the mindset and mentality of the complainer, just like that. Anything, if, if, it is not, if, if it is hard, too hard for them, they just complain. Not thinking of pushing their envelope, not thinking of trying harder to reach that raised bar, they just complain. For, they complain for being chided, they complain for being reproached, but that's, if you're an adult, you should know you're doing it for yourselves, you know, to make yourself smarter, make yourself smarter, make yourself more capable, make yourself more rational and scientific, to make you turn yourselves into a scientific and rational thinker. But if they are incapable of following that, then they complain. It's not something to complain about. You're not doing this for me. I'm already, I know this stuff. That's why I'm teaching you. That's why I'm the professor. And someone in a, uh, someone in this role, right? Someone in the role of a trainer, someone in the role of a uh, uh, boot camp drill sergeant will have to, is charged with the uh, responsibility to reproach you, the underperformers, to chide the underperformers. Boot camp drill sergeant is not a caregiver. And some people who are crying and complaining, they, they okay, are what were they so mindset. This part can be stupid. who gives you? I mean, in what class do you learn like this? And it is only something like this is only for people who have that um, strict mind. A strict disciplined mind. Okay, I guess. Don't understand any of this. You'll just always say it's too hard for me. Right? That's what they do. And I've been telling you, this is like, you get kicked, you get hit, of course. Uh, yes. Some people cannot take it. Some oh, people oh. think they are in a martial arts class and then complain. And stronger. You will never get, you will never learn uh, crying out and complaining because your ego is hurt because you, you fight yourself. If you're crying uh, because of that, without more complaining than, uh, because uh, motivational. of that, without motivational. making efforts to push yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, back to, uh, okay. uh, you know, I really uh, don't want to uh, digress from the, uh, the lecture, but um, it, when it comes to that, it's inevitable, right? Some people don't wake up ever. So never wake up from there and never break out of their own hard shell. Now, so this was the uh, uh, regression result of the uh, Apple. For the uh, for that period of five years, 2011 through 2015, and the uh, slope of this trend. So these were actual scatter plot of Apple. The slope of slope of the line was you know uh, 0 0.875, and the vertical intercept was 0 0.0115. That means uh, tomorrow actually we're gonna actually run the regression, right? We're gonna uh, because we have data of Apple that we downloaded earlier, right? And so we're going to download also S&P 500 data, uh, monthly data, uh, between uh, 2018 and 2000 uh, for five years, right? Monthly data for five years between 2018 and uh, 2023, right? Um, July to July, right? And then we will be able to run regression. Uh, so we will find beta values and find alpha and we'll also uh, uh, graph the uh, this trend line so that will be uh, for tomorrow that will be a very exciting uh, experience okay uh, and uh, all right so uh, let's continue you know the market is zero Apple market return is zero Apple's return is at least uh, uh, zero uh, so the uh, Market return is uh, uh, Apple's return will be at least 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.0115 percent, right? And um, if market return is like you know this one fell exactly on the straight line, market return was something like 8.2 percent. Apple was uh, in the past it was like Apple was somewhere like 7.5 percent or something. Uh, this one looks more like 8 percent, 8 point something. So with beta, then what can we do? Now, beta by itself, I mean, there are two things that beta can do. One, uh, 
Now, of course, when uh, beta measures the uh, systematic risk, right? And I told you the uh, part of the variance that comes from uh, the correlation uh, with the market is called volatility, right? So beta is the measure of the volatility. And so when you uh, using, uh, uh, what you can do is you can construct a portfolio with varying degrees of beta. I mean, uh, you may not, uh, I said, you know what, uh, uh, systematic risk doesn't go away by diversification but non-systematic risks can be diversified away. Uh, but still, uh, non-systematic uh, risk of individual stocks can be reduced to the system, exactly to the systematic risk. If you construct a portfolio with varying degrees of beta, then the systematic risk can be of the portfolio, systematic risk of the portfolio, not individual stocks systematic risk, but the system, uh, not individual stocks beta, but the uh, beta of the portfolio can be reduced to zero, one, right? Okay, here. Uh, one was just picked as a, uh, a reference point because beta of one means your portfolio uh, will uh, respond to the uh, uh, market <coughs> exactly by, you know, uh, uh, by one, right? Exactly the same lockstep. But actually the uh, goal of the uh, portfolio is not to... Uh, 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 maximize or you know uh, minimize the beta of the portfolio it's actually to maximize the sharp ratio sharp ratio <clears throat> and sharp ratio is like you know uh, reward to risk ratio remember mean uh, mean uh, standard deviation uh, uh, ratio which is you know output to input ratio and uh, something similar to that in portfolio, right? You want to maximize your sharp ratio. But you know, that uh, topic is not discussed in 100. It will be discussed in 300, finance 300. Okay. So if you want to learn more about uh, how to maximize the sharp ratio, then uh, finance 300 is the course you need to take. Okay. But here, I just used, you know, one <clears throat> as the reference point. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you don't want, you know, more volatility than the market. Uh, you don't want a more volatile uh, and less volatility than the market. And if that is the case, then <clears throat> uh, beta of one, when making the uh, uh, portfolio beta equal to one, would be uh, a nice, you know, uh, strategy. I mean, if you're trying to uh, just, you know, uh, emulate. Uh, uh, the S and P 500, right? Okay. One is what? Uh, if the beta is one, what, what does that mean? Uh, it is the market's risk, simply the market's risk, right? If Apple's beta is one, what does that mean? Uh, market goes up by one, uh, ten percent. Uh, Apple goes up by ten percent as well. Where uh, also, but then the downside is market goes down by ten percent. Apple is going to go down exactly by ten percent. But the portfolio beta, if portfolio beta is exactly one, then uh, that means what the volatility of your portfolio will be just the volatility of the market no no greater or no less in other words no worse no better right and you might wonder wouldn't, wouldn't you want, want it to be better don't you want the uh, then the uh, portfolio beta to be zero no you don't want the portfolio beta to be zero why because if zero means there is no exploitable correlation between the market and your portfolio that means when most of your portfolio does nothing it doesn't go up at all right when the market goes down it doesn't do anything to the portfolio right so is that what you want huh you, if market is doing well, you want to uh, want your portfolio uh, exactly also replicate the market's result or better. I mean, if the uh, portfolio beta is two, yeah, market goes up by ten percent. Ten percent, your portfolio will go up by twenty percent. But then the downside is, uh, market goes down by ten percent, your portfolio will, will fall by twenty uh, percent. Uh, so you don't want that. You want your portfolio. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, to move just as only as much as the market. Uh, uh, you want of uh, volatility to be only as uh, you know, uh, volatile as the market. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, high beta is good when high positive beta is good when uh, market's doing well. But you know, when market's doing badly, high uh, positive uh, beta is bad because you will. Uh, you don't want you don't want the uh, portfolio beta to be negative or zero because then. Uh, so anyway, um, get the idea. Uh, constructing a portfolio with varying degrees of beta to uh, bring it close to uh, one, and uh, your volatility will only be as much as you know 
the volatility of the market. That's the reason. Um, a second, right? Um, uh, second uh, use of beta is uh, the use of beta in capital asset pricing model or CAPM. CAPM is, you know, it's a little misnomer. Why? Why is it a misnomer? Actually, it doesn't, a capital asset pricing model doesn't directly price any asset. Okay? So, um, uh, a capital asset pricing model is actually uh, you, uh, the model to calculate the, uh, 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 the required return. You understand? The required return is what? The discount rate used in the stock pricing model. Remember, dividend discount model. And in the dividend discount model, there is always required return. And it was given all the time. I mean, and I told you, um, we are taking it as given. But in reality, there is no such thing as given required return. Because every stock is different. Every stock's risk is different, right? There is nothing given. You'll have to find it. You'll have to calculate it. And to calculate it, uh, it has to be, since every stock has a different risk, systematic risk, uh, different data, in other words. Every stock is different data. So you need a required return that is adjusted for the beta that's specific to that company. Make sense? So uh, CAPM is the model to calculate the risk adjusted, uh, in other words, beta adjusted required return. Well, of course, required, the, another notation for required return is uh, capital uh, cost of equity, KE, case of E, remember? Cost of equity. So here, this notation is all, you know, uh, uh, cost. So let's take a look at the uh, CAPM. Uh, CAPM is basically uh, uh, the difference, uh, the uh, linear function. If you, you may have noticed, uh, you should notice, uh, basically it's a, um, a linear function between uh, uh, market risk premium on the market and individual stocks risk premium. Now, take a look at this. Isn't this, this is, uh, what is risk premium? Risk premium is the uh, um, excess return over uh, the risk-free return. And you all understand what risk-free return is. Uh, the return on the, uh, return on the, uh, um, uh, uh, the treasury is risk-free return. Remember that a uh, short-term treasury uh, bill, uh, like you know, uh, short-term treasury bill, um, uh, three months treasury bill is considered uh, risk-free because uh, there nothing is safer. You know, we did this over and over from the day one. Nothing is safer than the U.S. Treasury. Everyone remember that. So. Uh, if nothing is safe, safer than the treasury, right? Um, think about it. Um, so uh, your return on the treasury, three months treasury or one month treasury is risk free, right? Um, so even if you don't take any risk, right? Even if you don't take any risk, you can still do if uh, risk free return, treasury, the return of the treasury is 5%. Now what? Without taking any risk, you can still earn 5%. Right? Makes sense? And then, um, uh, if Apple uh, Apple's return is 15%, right? Uh, that's not all, 15% is not all uh, thanks to Apple, right? It is five um, percent is anyway something you earn without taking any risk. But uh, so the pure return to uh, Apple, I mean, uh, solely due to taking risk by investing Apple is uh, fifteen minus five. In other words, uh, the return over and above the risk-free return. That's called the risk premium because it's the premium is what premium is like the reward, right? And that 10% is the reward for taking uh, a risk greater than greater than uh, taking no risk, right? <laughs> in other words, if you put your money into a, a, a treasury, you know, you're taking no risk. So if you're taking a risk uh, by investing in Apple, uh, whatever is earned over and above risk rate return is the reward for in taking the risk. 
So that is called the risk premium, right? And then uh, uh, suppose you just, you know, uh, uh, rather than Apple, uh, uh, you you just, you know, uh, buy on average stock. Okay, average stock would earn average market return, right? So average. Um, Uh, average return on the market, how do you, uh, it's the uh, return on the uh, market portfolio. I mean, market portfolio is a hypothetical portfolio where you have every uh, stock traded in the market, one share each, right? One share each. And um, of course, in reality, it should be exactly like in the, uh, uh, the weight of each, uh, I mean, think about it. The market capitalization of uh, General Motors or uh, General Electrics cannot be the same as the market capitalization of a small company. But anyway, uh, ignore all that. Let's say, uh, what, rep what would represent the market? S&P 500 index would very well represent the market because in S&P 500, there are 500 companies that are most representative uh, of the U.S. economy, right? 500 sectors that represents, you know, like uh, the best performer, right? Uh, in each industry, right? Of, you know, a 500 industry, right? So if you have one share of each of these 500 companies, then you have uh, a market uh, uh, portfolio. And the market portfolio, uh, so uh, uh, then uh, it's a hypothetical uh, portfolio. Uh, but the return on the, uh, the market portfolio is simply what? Return on the S&P 500 uh, index, right? So uh, if you just buy an average stock in the market, right, you're taking an average risk, right? Based on, and then uh, even even if it is just an average stock, uh, average stock would be have a risk, and average stock would have a risk and greater than the risk free. So obviously, if uh, S and P five uh, on average the market earns ten percent, right? Uh, the difference between the uh, risk free return and the market return is called market risk free. In this case, five percent. And then, <clears throat> so think about think of this as uh, Y, right? Uh, cost of equity on X minus, you know, cost of, you know, this is risk-free return, right? Um, so Apple's uh, risk premium, call, uh, that is Y, and this is X, right? Market risk premium is and Think about it. X is the dependent, uh, independent variable, and Y is the uh, uh, dependent variable. And think about it. Isn't, I've been telling you, market is the uh, independent variable because no company is free from the market. No individual stock is uh, uh, insulated from the market, right? So if market goes up, most stocks are cyclical, they go up. If market goes up, most stocks go down. Make sense? So just like, you know, uh, a linear function, right? It's a relationship between the uh, uh, excess return on uh, or risk premium on Apple and the risk return on, on the market. And uh, uh, X, uh, Y equals this specification, Y equals X times beta, that means what? If Apple's beta is three, what does that mean? Uh, Apple's risk premium will be three times the mar uh, market's risk premium, right? Doesn't that make sense? Why, if Apple's beta is three, that means what? Apple is three times more volatile, three times as volatile as the market. So then, it's isn't it only, uh, uh, isn't it only uh, uh, rational that Apple's risk premium should be three times the uh, uh, market's risk premium because Apple is three times more volatile. There will have to be, you know, uh, three times the compensation for that uh, three uh, more volatile, three times more volatile uh, stock should the compensation for that must be also three times the uh, return on the market. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, uh, let me use this analogy. <clears throat> what is, <clears throat> what is the, um, Average life expect. Uh, I mean, what what are the chances of uh, uh, dying in uh, in line of duty? I mean, if you are an average worker in New York City, average you know uh, office worker in New York City, what are the chances of uh, dying in line of duty while you know, in other words while you're at work? Huh? But let's say uh, the chances of that is you know um, uh, ten percent. But what are the chances of you know? Uh, uh, New York State uh, firefighter, I mean, New York City firefighter or police officer dying in line of duty. The chance, let's say that's 30%. That's like three times higher than the uh, uh, average uh, office worker in New York City. 
right? Average white collar worker. In the and what are the chances of dying in line of duty uh, for a uh, military, uh, uh, a member of armed service, for example, Navy SEAL or special Green Beret or special task force team? They would have much higher chances of, you know, uh, uh, dying in line of duty. Maybe, you know, they're 60%, let's say. And then that's six times average, you know, uh, uh, white collar worker in New York City. Make sense? And suppose the uh, uh, salary is, you know, uh, based on the... Uh, this, this, uh, so, you know, the salary is... Let's be this fact is the only fact. And I paid on the fuck back. 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 But you right. New York City uh, police officer and firefighter, uh, their salary should be, if they are, you know, uh, chances are three times uh, average, you know, worker, then shouldn't it be uh, compensated by uh, three times? In other words, if this is, you know, um, average worker makes, you know, uh, $50,000 a year, let's say, then if uh, uh, New York City, uh, somebody who's doing, you know, more dangerous uh, work, right? Uh, and if they are, you know, uh, three times their risk of, you know, dying is three times, then shouldn't that be uh, three times the average worker's compensation, right? Make sense? That's what, that's the logic behind CAPM. Uh, Apple's risk premium should be, if Apple's beta is three times, because that means, you know, Apple's three times riskier than uh, average with uh, the market, average of the market, then um, uh, that is captured by beta, uh, that volatility is captured by beta. So, uh, Apple's risk premium must be three times, right? Average, you know, risk premium, market risk premium. Then, uh, so this is a linear function, y equals x times uh, a beta format. Then what we are interested in is only not the uh, risk premium per se, but uh, required return, uh, the retur required return on Apple. So then to isolate only a uh, required k, uh, x, required return for Apple, then you move this to the uh, right-hand side. Uh, then it becomes this. So this is kappa. This is, you know, how you, uh, calculate the uh, so then now with this you can you can uh, measure you can me uh, you can plug that required return into uh, DDM dividend discount model you understand that required return in dividend discount model came from CAPM right that's why I said you know CAPM is a slight bit normal because CAPM by itself doesn't price anything it just gives you the required uh, it allows you to calculate the required return. Okay, so basically, you know, uh, uh, CAPM is derived from a uh, uh, security uh, market line. Security market line is basically uh, what uh, you are plotting uh, uh, the return uh, against uh, beta. Of course, security market line would increase as the beta increases. Right. In other words, return should required return should increase as the beta increases. I mean, the higher the beta. Uh, the higher the required return, right? Okay. Um, so uh, that's it. Um, uh, there's a lot more to talk about the uh, uh, security market line because you will see there is you know, uh, a capital asset allocation line and you know uh, a capital al allocation line, uh, capital market line, security market line. There are similar uh, graphs you will see along the way, uh, but we don't have time. Uh, we're out of time. We're actually you know like ten minutes past the. Uh, uh, the it's like you know, uh, uh, seventy. It's been like seventy minutes. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't think the video, <laughs> and I cannot even post it on YouTube because the file size is too large. You might wonder, uh, Professor, why don't you post it on YouTube? It can't. The YouTube maximum is like minutes. This is like you know, uh, every lecture is like sixty minutes at least. There's no way uh, it cannot cannot be processed on uh, YouTube. Uh, I would like to. So um, uh, you can only. Uh, uh, you can only watch it on watch this video on the blackboard. Maybe in the in the future, I may be able to uh, figure out a way to uh, uh, cut it up using you know like a video maker uh, into a, like a, a smaller segment, like 30 minute segment, and then post it on YouTube. But now at this point, it's only on the blackboard. All righty, so that's the end of it. Uh, that's uh, that wraps up everything about the uh, risk and return, and that's the last topic uh, of this semester. All right. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was able to uh, upload all the videos to YouTube, right? And uh, it just takes so much time to uh, process it.
just to upload one video and make it, you know, uh, uh, available on uh, YouTube. It takes uh, like at least like 30 minutes to uh, upload one video. Anyway, um, so um, we will we will actually do all of this tomorrow. We will actually do hands-on right experience right we'll, we will do the uh, uh hands-on training right uh practice tomorrow we're gonna uh, as i said we're gonna calculate beta right uh by regressing you know uh, uh apples you know return or over you know uh markets return which is you know as uh, to, to do that we will need to download s p 500 data as well and then after we calculate beta, uh, we can actually plug it into a golden growth model, right? To um, uh, uh, find required return for, uh, I mean, you know, we can, we can use it. Uh, I mean, we, we calculate, you know, uh, uh, through, you know, CAPM, we calculate the required return of Apple and we can plug it into our golden growth model to find to price Apple, right? Uh, but once again, this is a um, CAPM uh, is a, uh, a sort of general equilibrium model. In other words, uh, if Apple is at equilibrium, right, this should be the uh, uh, return. So any return that is, you know, uh, I, I believe uh, uh, it was slightly uh, uh, ref, uh, slightly mentioned at some point. Uh, let me, uh, if, uh, so think about it. If this re uh, required return, uh, uh, is general general equilibrium model basically for you know uh, uh, any return above this means Apple is undervalued, underpriced, right? And any, uh, in other words, any uh, any return below this means Apple is overvalued. And you might wonder what if. Uh, if return is higher than Apple is undervalued, return is you know uh, uh, lower than uh, lower than this, then you know uh, lower than the required return calculated by Capm, then uh, Apple is you know undervalued. Uh, at first, you you know you may find it a little you know uh, confusing. Why? But you know. Um, uh, Allocation line, point. Uh, capital yeah. market line, security market line. There are similar uh, graphs you will see along the way, uh, but we don't have time. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, we're actually, you know, like 10 minutes in, past the uh, in past. Uh, the, uh, but that logic, right? I'll, I'll leave it as food for thought, right? I'll leave it as, you know, a food for thought. So tomorrow, uh, uh, when we do the uh, uh, actual exercise, right? Uh, you know, if you can answer why that is the case, then well, that's wonderful. I mean, I will give you five extra points for you know, naming the answer. Okay. So, um, well, uh, today um, uh, it's eight o five. We're just still, you know, uh, uh, we still have ten minutes. So. If you have any questions, I'll take the questions. You have any questions? Any questions? Jasmine already uh, uh, took a leave. Uh, uh, all right. So it uh, looks like there's no, uh, there are no questions. Oh, Jasmine just lost connection, I guess. Uh, if there are no questions, then we'll just call it a day here. Okay, we'll just call it a day, and I uh, will uh, see you tomorrow. But don't forget, uh, your final is due tomorrow, 11.59 p.m., right? 
Some people, two people have already submitted. I wonder how they could do Of course, they, they watched my videos already. And um, because videos were all already, you know, uh, available. Uh, but, you know, you, um, you still have, you still have, you know, uh, today and tomorrow. So uh, please don't forget. And there can be no extension, no late submission for final. Because I must calculate, I must compile the data to calculate uh, the grade. And as you understand, my grades are based on, you know, uh, uh, mean and standard deviation of your uh, weighted average. And uh, so your, your data must come in by the cutoff, by the cutoff line, by, by the cutoff point. If it, and if it comes, so there, if it comes in after cutoff, there's no way it can be processed, right? So everything is as of 11.59 uh, tomorrow and all data must be, all data must come in and they must be processed together. They must compiled and processed together. And if your data is missing, then your data is missing. You don't get any, you know, uh, there's no late uh, submission, no extension. It cannot be, it cannot be put back into the uh, compilation, the data pool, right? Compiled data pool, right? It cannot be put back in there. The data must be reported to the registrar within 48 hours. Okay, so please don't forget, uh, final is due tomorrow. Okay, no exception. All right, so uh, that's for today. Uh, have a great evening, everyone, and I will see you all. Uh, back at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Thank All you. Right? All right. You're welcome, Brandon. Take care, everyone. Have a great night. Okay. I'll start recording.